Thank you all. If you, if you have a seat, you can sit down. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President-elect, Mr. Vice President-elect, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States of America. Today, the legislative, the executive, the judicial branches of our constitutional government come together for the 58th inauguration of the President of the United States. Millions of people all over the world will watch and will listen to this event. 36 years ago at his first inauguration, it was also the first inauguration on this side of the Capitol, President Ronald Reagan said that what we do here is both commonplace and miraculous. Commonplace every four years since 1789, when President George Washington took this exact same oath. Miraculous, because we've done it every four years since 1789, and the example it sets for democracies everywhere. Washington believed the inauguration of the second president would be more important than the inauguration of the first. Many people had taken control of a government up until then, but few people had ever turned that control willingly over to anyone else. And as important as the transfer of the, the first transfer of power was, many historians believe that the next election was even more important. When in 18 and 1, one group of people, arguably for the first time ever in history, willingly, if not enthusiastically, gave control of the government to people they believed had a dramatically different view of what the government would, should, and could do. After that election that actually discovered a flaw in the Constitution itself, which was, which was remedied by the 12th Amendment, Thomas Jefferson at that inauguration, beyond the chaos of the election that had just passed, said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. After four years of civil war, Lincoln's second inaugural speech tried to find reason for the continued war when he pointed out that both sides prayed to the same God. He'd earlier written about those fervent prayers that one side must be and both sides may be wrong. But in 1865, he looked to the future and the memorable moment in that speech was with malice toward none and charity for all. In the middle of the Depression, the country was told that the only thing we had to fear was fear itself. And President Kennedy talked about the obligation in democracy to country. The great question that day was, ask what you can do for your country. So we come to this place again, commonplace and miraculous, a national moment of celebration, but not a, not a celebration of victory, a celebration of democracy. And as we begin that celebration, I call on His Eminence Timothy Michael Cardinal Dolan, Reverend Dr. Samuel Rodriguez, and Pastor Paula White Kane to provide readings and the invocation. The prayer of King Solomon from the Book of Wisdom. Let us pray. God of our ancestors and Lord of mercy, you have made all things, and in your providence have charged us to rule the creatures produced by you, to govern the world in holiness and righteousness, and to render judgment with integrity of heart. Give us wisdom. For we are your servants, weak and short-lived, lacking in comprehension of judgment and of laws. Indeed, though one might be perfect among mortals, if wisdom which comes from you be lacking, we count for nothing. Now with you is wisdom, who knows your will and was there when you made the world 
who understands what is pleasing in your eyes, what is conformable with your commands, send her forth from your holy heavens, from your glorious throne dispatch her, that she may be with us and work with us, that we may grasp what is pleasing to you, for she knows and understands all things and will guide us prudently in our affairs and safeguard us by her glory. Amen. From the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He blesses those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. For you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on its stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, that everyone will praise your heavenly Father, respectfully in Jesus' name. We come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, with grateful hearts, thanking you for this great country that you have decreed to your people. We acknowledge we are a blessed nation with a rich history of faith and fortitude, with a future that is filled with promise and purpose. We recognize that every good and every perfect gift comes from you and the United States of America is your gift, for which we proclaim our gratitude. As a nation, we now pray for our president, Donald John Trump, Vice President Michael Richard Pence, and their families. We ask that you would bestow upon our president the wisdom necessary to lead this great nation, the grace to unify us, and the strength to stand for what is honorable and right in your sight. In Proverbs 21.1, you instruct us that our leader's heart is in your hands. Gracious God, reveal unto our president the ability to know the will, your will, the confidence to lead us in justice and righteousness, and the compassion to yield to our better angels. While we know there are many challenges before us, in every generation you have provided the strength and power to become that blessed nation. Guide us in discernment, Lord, and give us that strength to persevere and thrive. Now bind and heal our wounds and divisions and join our nation to your purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The psalmist declared, let your favor be upon this one nation under God. Let these United States of America be that beacon of hope to all people and nations under your dominion, a true hope for humankind. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Missouri State University Chorale. Strangers shoes, one 
Once we were strangers, we were strangers. We were Well, the Missouri State University crowd practices and performs about two blocks from my home in Springfield, Missouri, so it was easy to find them, and we're pleased they're here. It's also a great opportunity for me to introduce uh, my colleague, the Senator from New York, Chuck Schumer. My fellow Americans, we live in a challenging and tumultuous time, a quickly evolving, ever more interconnected world, a rapidly changing economy that benefits too few while leaving too many behind, a fractured media, a politics frequently consumed by rancor. We face threats, foreign and domestic. In such times, faith in our government our institutions, and even our country can erode. Despite these challenges, I stand here today confident in this great country for one reason, you, the American people.
We Americans have always been a forward-looking, problem-solving, optimistic, patriotic, and decent people. Whatever our race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, whether we are immigrant or native-born, whether we live with disabilities or do not, in wealth or in poverty, we are all exceptional in our commonly held yet fierce devotion to our country and in our willingness to sacrifice our time, energy, and even our lives to making it a more perfect union. Today we celebrate one of democracy's core attributes, the peaceful transfer of power. And every day we stand up for core democratic principles enshrined in the Constitution, the rule of law, equal protection for all under law, the freedom of speech, press, religion, that the things that make America, America. And we can gain strength from reading our history and listening to the voices of average Americans. They always save us in times of strife. One such American was Major Sullivan Ballou. On July 14, 1861, when the North and South were lining up for their first battle, a time when our country was bitterly divided and faith in the future of our country was at a nadir, Major Ballou of the Second Rhode Island Volunteers penned a letter to his wife, Sarah. It is one of the greatest letters in American history. It shows the strength and courage of the average American. Allow me to read some of his words, which echo through the ages. My very dear Sarah, he wrote, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with the mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet, my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. Sullivan Ballou gave his life on the battlefield a week later at the first battle of Bull Run. It is because Sullivan Ballou and countless others believed in something bigger than themselves and were willing to sacrifice for it that we stand today in the full blessings of liberty in the greatest country on earth. And that spirit lives on in each of us, Americans whose families have been here for generations and those who have just arrived. And I know our best days are yet to come. I urge all Americans to read Ballou's full letter. His words give me solace, strength. I hope they will give you the same. Now, please stand while the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, administers the oath of office to the Vice President of the United States. Please your hand on the Bible. Please your Vice President-elect, would you raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. The duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Congratulations.